before I get started, I just kind of want to introduce how I kind of fit into this conversation. Um, while I was doing my, my master's um, at the GSD, I decided to study uh, the carceral system as my focus for my thesis, my architecture thesis. Um, having been working a lot in advocacy in Black Lives Matter and the, in the NAACP in the, in the city of Boston, I really wanted to focus on something that was extraordinarily emotional, relevant to me and my own family's legacy and history, as well as something that I think would challenge um, myself, but not just myself, but also the university to look at issues that are kind of uh, more socially oriented. Uh, and so I, this is my thesis from that, that, that time uh, called Societal Simulations, A Carceral Geography of Restoration. So I wanted to go to the city that inspired me to become an architect and urban planner in the first place, which is Newark, New Jersey. Newark sits about nine miles from Manhattan, just for context. Uh, and it's a historically black and brown city, also known as the Brick City. So this is the home that my mother and her siblings and my grandparents grew up in. Uh, it's in a very nice neighborhood with tree-lined streets. Uh, it's near one of the city's more major parks. However, um, as a child, I would go back and forth from um, my house growing up in Connecticut to this home in New Jersey. And to get to this house, when you get off the highway, you have to go through a city that is otherwise heavily blighted. Um, and seeing that sort of discrepancy between the environment that my grandparents were in, the one that I was in at home, and the ones that just immediately surrounded their little haven, it uh, really inspired me to look into architecture and the, the interface of architecture and planning. So why Newark? Newark to me is sort of the telltale story of industrialized cities, or post-industrialized cities rather. And so the city, like many others on the East Coast, uh, really became to diversify in the 1900s, when uh, there's a huge influx of immigration from Europe. Uh, and so this is just a map showing the different sort of ethnic racial pockets that started to establish over the city uh, in that time period. At one point in the 1930s, 1940s, the city really started to become like a bustling hub and almost served as a twin city to New York, uh, really supporting uh, financial services, uh, especially such as uh, insurance. Uh, and it also had one of the largest ports in the country. However, like most American cities, Newark was, uh, I guess you can say, uh, influenced by redlining. And so there were significant swaths of the city that only white residents were able to acquire property on and most black and brown residents were then relegated to uh, sort of these uh, outer corners of the city. In 1967, um, similar to other major cities at the time, there was a series of race riots. The main one took place over three days and resulted in significant damage of the downtown center, which again was sort of this twin to, to Manhattan. Um, and as you see in the next slide, it really resulted in significant white flight. Um, and so what, what's sad about Newark is that it used to have like a huge amount of diversity across like uh, ethnic uh, groups from Europe, Europe, you had blacks and browns people, but uh, after that point, uh, there was a, a significance of white flight. And with that came sort of the incarceration of this urban condition itself. Uh, this is an example of a public housing development in the city, not too far from downtown. If you go to this development, there's one way in and one way out. The entire development has other gates, though, all of which have been padlocked closed. So you would imagine this could have a, a numerous implications in terms of fire hazards and life safety, but instead this is how they treat a lot of the low-income residents. There has been a lot of significance of blight, such as fires and graffiti, uh, and homes like this are spread throughout the entire city's landscape. Um, and I guess what stood out to me was that it feels like the city had given up on itself and had prepared its population to be incarcerated. There, there's very little separation between the two. Uh, an example of the brick and the CMUs, this barbed wire, the chain linked fence and the graffiti. Um, again, this is everywhere across the city's landscape. Uh, incidents of gunshots going through windows and again, for our, I mean, um, having the, the plywood backing. Uh, it's just a, a depressed environment and it feels like the prisons that surround it. So here's one of those prisons that surrounds it, the Northern State Prison. So this is one of the a larger facilities for the state of New Jersey holding about 2,500 uh, people right now. If you go to the next slide, you can see that it actually stands right next to Newark International Airport, but also sits kind of opposite the highway or opposite the train tracks from the waste management facility. 
So if you were to go on site, you would smell all the waste that's being processed on that facility. Um, and for people who aren't allowed to leave on a regular basis, it's a pretty oppressive environment. The city of Newark also houses one of the county's juvenile detention facilities. Um, and I'm sure some of you are aware, but for those who are not, juvenile detention has been kind of increasingly getting smaller, which is a, a good thing kind of at the rec uh, recognition of the uh, sort of de detriment that juvenile detention has on people. Uh, and this facility is interesting because it sits very close to downtown and is opposite of charter school and relative to a lot of other sort of residential spaces. And so it's, it's I think it's kind of harrowing for the youth that live in the neighborhood because they're constantly aware of this sort of prospect of being uh, incarcerated in a facility like this. So with this urban condition in mind, one in four residents in Newark, New Jersey have a lifetime likelihood of being incarcerated. If you just let that sit in for a second, that's pretty heavy. Um, and this, I mean, it's, it's, it's all part of a bigger system. It's all part of the American carceral system. And so for bigger perspective, everyone should know that there's 7.3 million people who are in the carceral system. There are four parts of that system. One being prisons and jails, so that's incarceration, and then community supervision being probation and parole. Over time, so this is sort of the, the landscape of the carceral system. Over time, that those numbers have exploded, especially as a result of sort of things like the Sentencing Reform Act, the war on crime, the war on drugs, the three strikes policies. Um, sort of in the early Obama administration, and there was a lot of federal pressure to sort of start decarcerating, um, especially among youth. Um, but with that decarceration, there's a whole litany of issues of what do you do with those facilities? Uh, as an example, in the state of Connecticut, there are about 50 kids who are currently incarcerated in their juvenile detention system. Uh, to keep just those 50 kids in, at a time, it's about a million dollars a year. So with fewer kids in the system, it's great, but the cost to keep them in there is exponentially greater. Uh, and this is just a breakdown of state, federal, uh, and local jails, as well as juvenile facilities and uh, other facilities such as uh, immigration detention. Uh, a lot of people think it's just violent crime, um, but it's also a huge proportion of drug and property and public order offenses. And just another lifetime likelihood, it is, you cannot talk about incarceration without linking it to race uh, and ethnicity. And so there's a one in three lifetime likelihood of black men to go to, to be incarcerated, a one in 18 for black women. We should note that uh, for black women especially, that is the population that is growing the fastest currently. Uh, and there are repercussions of this for family destabilization, especially because you're ripping away a lot of times mothers from their children, mothers from, the, from caretaking from their, their uh, adult uh, older parents. Um, but this is also uh, an issue and imbalance for Latinx men and women. Uh, as we said earlier in this talk, 76.6% of people recidivize within five years. That is absurd. Can, given the cost that we are spending to supposedly rehabilitate people, uh, the system's not working. And we should all acknowledge that what we have right now is broken and is functionally flawed. So I wanted to look at what the alternative could be. Um, and I knew for one, I didn't want it to be a prison. I think that the prison system as a whole is flawed, as I just said. And I think that we need to think about more innovative approaches that allow people to be to remain in their communities, to keep families stabilized, and to also stabilize communities such as Newark. And I approached the project by thinking about it as a village for, um, for restoration and an inoculation for recidivism. The next slide basically walks you through all the things of spatially, aesthetically, materiality of what is currently versus what I aspire to in the future. Um, and just the main things to think about are warmth, brightness, uh, ecology, freedom, uh, advancement. These are all uh, metrics of, for me, what success could be in this new system. I wanted to focus on Newark again because it was the space that in, in inspired me to be an architect. Uh, and I want to focus on Baxter Terrace, uh, highlighted here in orange. This particular uh, site is the site of the first public housing project in the city of Newark. If you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, it was this awful brick development uh, built in 1941, where it was actually segregated by floor plan, so by floor plate rather. 
every other floor, so black, white, black, for example. Uh, and then the facility was eventually torn down in 2012 because it was overrun by issues of uh, sex trafficking and drugs and gang violence uh, and has subsequently just said stayed vacant in the city. It's a pretty significant parcel and it's relatively close to downtown, but it's kind of has this, uh, people don't really want to touch it. No developer has really proposed any efforts on it since then. And so I wanted to create a model that was the village, but the village has three major components. One of rehabilitation, which is restorative justice for me. Empowerment, so including places of employment as well as activities because everybody deserves to have fun in my opinion. Uh, and security through housing. A lot of times we see that in recidivism, people are actually getting picked up and going back to uh, jail or prison because they're unable to secure housing. Uh, and housing insecurity in general in major cities is a huge concern. And so I just think that it's important to allow somebody to properly rehabilitate that they have to feel secure in their environment. I'm gonna walk you through some of the design that I had uh, done for this project. Uh, so this is the ground floor plan, as you can see. I, I was really hoping to not create something that would feel like it would stigmatize the residents of the facility. Um, and for one, it was important to maintain a street wall because um, that's how the rest of the city is. Uh, and once you enter the site and once you become a resident of this facility, that's when this, this sort of uh, the rigidity of the community starts to break down and starts to open up to landscape and the amenities. On the ground floor, I also wanted to place a host of uh, retailers as well as uh, places of employment. It was really important to find companies and organizations that don't have that box that says, have you committed a felony offense? A lot of times that's a, a discriminatory uh, metric on a lot of applications. So I went through and found a bunch of companies that don't currently have that question. Um, as you'll get further in the presentation though, you'll also see that it was an opportunity to insert these spaces for restorative justice. So the residential component of the building uh, was pretty multifaceted. I wanted it to be an opportunity for people um, of different family structures to be able to reside on the site. Uh, if someone who lives alone, they could get a single room occupancy or a uh, one bedroom apartment. If you have a family of four, you could get a two bedroom or three bedroom unit. If you are an intergenerational family, there are, are units up to seven bedrooms that could, have, like, that could house grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, and kids. Um, it was really important that there is this flexibility and that you would not separate families just because there was an issue um, a, a within the, an interaction with the, the justice system. And then as you move up the building, um, the setbacks increase from, from the interior courtyard so that you allow more light to enter the units, as well as changing the typologies as well. So here's just an exterior view of the site. Again, I'm not looking for this to be revolutionary on the outside. I just wanted to somewhat blend in, have some nice features. I was imagining this sort of this articulated brick pattern. Um, but again, you're also not too far from New York. So like at, when you're standing on the site, you actually have an amazing view of, of, of Lower Manhattan. As you go into the site, there is a public promenade that starts to really insert uh, opportunities for ecology. Uh, there's a huge linkage to trauma and the, the benefit of green space, light, open air, water. And I want to integr integrate elements like that throughout the, the, the campus um, or the village. So there's a whole um, host of trees and tall grasses and water features. There's also an amphitheater. Uh, this is largely um, to help afford people the opportunity to celebrate the arts, to celebrate opportunities to be together. Um, and to to just have moments of relief in their lives because a lot of the times when people are being incarcerated, it's because of stressors. It's because of the trauma that they've experienced in the past. Uh, and just the view of what that amphitheater could look like. I'm actually imagining each of the terraces being grassed uh, just to provide more comfort um, as well as more greenery in the, sp in the space. A multi-purpose room. Uh, when I was doing this, this project, I actually kind of conducted little focus groups in the city and one of the things that people talked about was that there wasn't really a great space to have a party. It wasn't a really great space to have a quinceanera or a wedding or even a community meeting. And so to have an open space directly on site where residents could have their weddings, could have their, their kids' birthday parties, where they could have meetings uh, and really facilitate on site engagement was really important. And this is a sort of like this concrete and glass volume that's sitting over a water feature. 
so you can see just the, the volume right there. And then the last component of the project is the, the restorative justice. So uh, again, just to remind everybody, restorative justice is this practice in which you bring together uh, the person who's committed the crime or who's been convicted of the crime, the victim of the crime, as well as the community. And so I wanted to create spaces for this activity exclusively for the residents of the site that they can then invite others in to participate in this practice. Uh, and so I'm just gonna run you through a few of the different ones that I had designed for the site. This is called the Mounds. Um, and again, it's really an opportunity to integrate landscape, architecture, uh, and the practice of restorative justice. Stripes, radial. A, a few of them like this one, actually, um, they are trying to also create levels of, of variance, but they also can be used as sort of open space to be used on a regular basis. So maybe you have a, a booking system for nine to five, it's used for restorative justice and before and after hours, it can just be used for people to take picnics and whatnot. Pond, so this one's actually uh, has a view that directly overlooks a small pond on the site. The labyrinth, uh, I chose a labyrinth as one of the main ones to focus on just because labyrinths are used as a spiritual practice um, and acknowledging the spirituality of many people in the community. Uh, it's also a way to meditate. And so I want to create these spaces that people can have self-reflection or they could have um, an opportunity to kind of uh, become one with the earth, become one with themselves, Next, you can see a, a view of what that looks like. And the, the labyrinth actually has trees that are kind of scattered throughout the space itself. Hilltop. Uh, and this is me kind of thinking about MLK speech about like surmounting the hilltop. Um, but I want and also just creating a different perspective for people. So really bringing people up into space. If you go to the next slide so that they can then see a tree canopy below. Um, there aren't a lot of trees in the city unless you're you're fortunate enough to live in a certain neighborhood. Uh, and so to really have opportunities for people to become, um, to, to, to interact with that landscape within their own home environment as well. Walls, which is an exteriorized space. Um, and it's also to acknowledge that there is a lot of street art in the community. If you go to the next slide, it's, it's half restorative justice space, half gallery. And so you can invite residents to do exhibitions and actually use the walls as opportunities to display their art. And Firefield. This particular one is probably my favorite. Um, and during one of the focus groups I was doing, uh, one of the, the ladies I was talking to was talking about how she just missed all the flowers that she grew up seeing. She missed the rose gardens in her, in her grandmother's backyard. And someone was like, oh, my grandma had a rose garden. And I was like, my grandmother used to have a rose garden. Um, and so to have a uh, color and an opportunity to like really see the seasonalities and kind of depress yourself within that color uh, and that ecology. Next slide, let's see. It's frozen on my end. Anyone else? Yeah, it's frozen here. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. <laughs> and that was basically the end of my presentation. So 